your firm, Warwick, made a lot of waves and some headlines last week. The Wall Street Journal reporting that you're trying to open up a new fund to invest in oil and gas. Is this the time now that you should be investing in oil and gas, given the dynamic in the macro markets? Hi, good morning. Well, I can't discuss anything related to the fund, but what I can tell you is that the macro is really interesting. And my macro partner, Dan Drum, and I wrote a piece last week about a tale of two tails, because you can really see that the asymmetric tail risk in the commodity right now is as high as we've seen. So we can make very cogent arguments that crude could go above 100 into the 120, 150 type level. And we can make very cogent arguments that it could go very you know, far south. So we can see like 40 to 50 by the end of the year. And what we said is, you know, we think you have to manage the near term volatility. And in the context of uh, a long term structural underinvestment in hydrocarbons and also in other parts of the metals complex, including, you know, copper, uranium, nickel. So we're really bearing the fruits of our underinvestment over the past decade. So, so I mean, Kate, this is it's interesting only because you could argue that the last, say, six to 12 months, the world at large has realized that there is a reliance on oil and gas that cannot be just taken offline by flipping a switch. And that if you try to do that, prices rise and people feel the pinch of it. What do you think governments around the world have learned with regard to the glide path or the path with which you have to transition to clean energy from oil and gas? It's not just going to take two or five years. I don't, I don't know if the governments have learned it yet. But I think what we're actually seeing is that we're going to live in a dual world where there are renewables and there are hydrocarbons. And if you look at renewable investment over the first 20 years of this century, it's up 50 times, but it's still like 6% of supply. And at the same time, we see that hydrocarbon demand has been incredibly flat. Um, you know, just looking from 2009 to today, hydrocarbon demand is like, or supply as a percentage of total energy went from 81% to 79% of the mix. So we see that we're going to live in a world where there are electric vehicles and there are internal combustion engine solutions. And we need to keep that in context, because I think a lot of times when we're talking about hydrocarbons, there's a sense of schadenfreude that we've had this underinvestment and now prices are going to be very high. And that's not the case. The case is that we're actually afraid. And when we see high prices, we know, especially in the context of recessionary backdrop, that it will make prices fall. And, th and that will be celebrated, you know, politically, that will be celebrated in the popular news. But that does help. And while that does help solve short term inflation and ease inflation a bit, it is setting up for these hyper quick cycles that we see in oil and for oil prices going much higher. And, um, you know, we see like copper and oil are both down over 30 percent this year. But that is also setting up a longer term issue, which is the structural underinvestment. And I think that the solutions for that are probably not political. Most likely they're in the capital markets. Um, but I did want to say I think that we should prepare going into the end of the year for very high short term volatility. I mean, if you look at average intraday volatility for crude right now, it's like over four dollars a barrel for natural gas. It's between 50 and 60 cents an M. That's pretty high. And, you know, on the European side of our business, we see that just in the last two weeks, like over a a trillion and a half of liquidity has come out of the derivatives market because it increased in margin requirements for European and natural gas producers, uh, electric and natural gas producers. So that really matters in the derivatives market. And, you know, sort of going back to the theme of the short term, maybe providing lower prices, maybe easing inflation, maybe providing an entry point to some of these stocks or some of these commodities. It's not setting up for a, a great outcome for the world. It is probably setting up for a great outcome for cash flow for producers, but it's not setting up for a great outcome, which means we do expect to see much higher oil prices. Um, and if you think about like going back to the, the margin situation in Europe, which you know we've talked a lot about in the last week, taking a trillion and a half of liquidity out of the derivatives market makes it harder to finance the upstream energy projects that you need to settle out this volatility and increase production. And on the renewable side, for things like aluminum smelters or copper smelters, taking that much liquidity out of the system also makes it very hard to finance those projects, which are critical for the energy transition. So we, we see that the volatility as creating a pretty difficult macro context, 
which means that we probably do have upward price pressure on the commodities. My guess is after this short-term volatility sort of plays out. So, so Kate, we've just got a few moments left here. You mentioned the, the capital investment and, and, and some of the investments that you are thinking about making. Are there specific companies, types of companies, that would stand to benefit, relatively speaking, more so than others with regard to the oil and gas trade? Yeah, I would say two things. One, you know, if, you, if you're a CIO that doesn't have a policy that prohibits you from investing in extractives, what energy and also natural resources on the metals and mining side are doing in portfolios is exactly what they're supposed to do. When growth is not in, when valuation matters, when there are structural supply issues, like you mentioned, the world becoming conscious of over the past year, and when there are these, there's a, an awareness of the resource dependency that we all have then all of a sudden energy performs very well in a portfolio and it starts to argue for the position of natural resources in these portfolios. And it's one of the best performing sectors if you talk to people in allocation over the past two years, both on public and private. So that's number one. Number two, valuation in this space is not that interesting because everything is basically within half an EBITDA turn of four times. So if you look at the super majors, they're at three and a half times EV to EBITDA. If you look at the large caps, they're at about four times so there's not a lot of variety, but in looking at allocation right now, I want to see duration of resource base. So that means over 10 years of real inventory in on the left side of the cost curve plays. I want to see a very strong balance sheet. I want to see valuation that's appropriate, and I would pick my entry moments. So for Conoco right now, they're down 10% from the high, trading at four times. They have an amazing to be in Permian with the Shell Permian and Concho acquisition last year. And, uh, you know, they have a 30 percent cash flow yield sure. and they're paying back 30 percent of all free cash flow to investors every year. That feels like a really nice place to play. And they're the second largest oil producer in the U.S. after Exxon.